If you're Dutch, you probably know what this is. It's a coin you put into a shopping cart to unlock it. You probably also have this in other countries. It's also technical debt. But before I explain why, let's first take a walk. So my office is back there. Pretty nice place, isn't it? So what is technical debt? Well, optimally you want your software to have full code coverage, use the latest and greatest libraries that are available, be 100% future-proof so you never ever have to look at your code again. Well, obviously that's not the reality. The reality is when you create an application you often have to deal with deadlines. And that means because of that deadline you won't be able to do things perfectly. So you're going to use shortcuts in your programs to make sure things work. But you know that you probably have to address them in the future. That's an example of technical debt. When you work at a startup, you're also acutely aware of technical debt. Often you start building a brand new application using the latest and greatest tools. And you kind of make fun of all those other companies that use old-fashioned crap. But as time passes, you become a company that also uses old-fashioned crap. And you're going to need to do something to keep that under control. Why are these shopping cart coins technical debt? In the past, if you wanted to get a shopping cart, you just grab one. The problem was that people started to take these shopping carts home and use them for decoration, or for the kids to play in, or I don't know what else for. The issue is that these shopping carts are expensive. They cost hundreds of euros to produce. So the supermarket added a system where you had to put in a coin in order to use the shopping cart. And that prevented people from taking those carts home for some reason. I'm not sure what the psychology is behind it, but apparently it works. But Nowadays, people are using physical money less and less, so people don't carry coins anymore. So what was the solution? Well, they introduced these plastic coins that you can get for free at the supermarket. There's like a huge bowl of them, and you just use that, put it in a shopping cart, and then you go shopping. But that's weird, because the whole idea of the system is that it dissuades people from taking those carts home, because they want to get their money back. And it's not like people think, oh, I have to get this cart back, because otherwise, I won't get this worthless plastic coin back, of which there is a whole freaking bowl in the supermarket. To do it right, supermarkets need new shopping carts that use another system, like detecting when a shopping cart is outside of the range of the supermarket or something like that. But that's expensive. So they have this temporary cheap solution, making these plastic coins is cheap, but ultimately they're going to need to solve it. And that's why it's an example of technical debt. There are actually multiple types of technical debt. I'll talk about that in a minute. And I also have a few tips for you on how to manage technical debt and keep it under control at your company. But before I do that, I have to buy some food. So I'm going to use this and then I'll see you back at the office in a minute. There are three main types of technical debt. The first type of technical debt is deliberate technical debt. When you're working as a software team, you probably have some kind of deadline that you have to take into account. And that means you can probably not do everything completely, perfectly, 100% the way that you like to do it. So that means you're going to take some shortcuts that you know in the back of your mind, you're going to have to take care of in the future. That's deliberate technical debt. Especially if you're in a startup, this is actually really important because development time in a startup in the beginning is much more expensive than later on because then you'll have the product out the door, you have some customers, so you have a bit more flexibility. But in the beginning, making mistakes is really costly. So you want to reduce the time as much as possible that you release a piece of software, get some feedback from your customers and adapt to it. Startups often immediately incur some kind of technical debt. The counterbalance to that is that a startup often also starts from scratch developing their code. So they'll be using the latest and greatest libraries, hopefully if they did their research. What this also means is that any piece of software probably has some sort of technical debt. You just can't get around it. There's always something to improve. The second type of technical debt is accidental or an outdated design. So when you initially design your software, you try to find a balance between future-proofing your design and being able to quickly deliver something to the market. But that means that Probably when you deliver it to the market, the requirements are going to change. You're going to learn new things about what your software needs to do. And that means the design gets outdated. Other things that might happen is that you rely on libraries that get updated. So now you have to update your software to use the new version of the library. 
and so on and so on. So if you designed your software well from the start, you can probably get away with pretty small refactors to solve most of those problems. But sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and go for a more full-blown refactor because that's something fundamental that has to change in the way you design the system. But even if you created the perfect design in the beginning, programming languages evolve and change all the time. So that means you're going to have to change your code to keep up with that. I mean, look at how Python has evolved over the last years. Lots of things have changed and that's going to impact the way that your software works. Libraries are going to get outdated. Best practices are going to change and you need to take that into account or otherwise you're going to end up with lots of compatibility issues. And in my experience, the older piece of software is the more this becomes a problem. The third type of technical debt is bit rot. And that's what's going to happen if you make lots and lots of small incremental changes to your code. Probably not even you, maybe other people working on your team. And those people might not understand completely the design of your system or how it was originally intended. So you end up with layer upon layer upon layer. You're losing efficiency. Things become less clear and start to be a bit messed up and rotten, basically. So that's bit rot. So three types, deliberate, accidental and bit rot. If you want to keep technical debt in check in your organization, you need to actively manage it. And I have five tips for you to help you do that. The first tip is that you can greatly diminish technical debt in the beginning stage of software development by thinking about your design before you start coding away. When you're at this thinking stage, making changes is still easy. So it's good to spend time there and take a methodical approach to coming up with your design. To help you out with this, I created a free guide that describes my process for doing it. It's available at arioncodes.com slash design guide. It consists of seven steps that each take different aspects of your design into consideration. I've tried to keep it short and to the point so you can take in the information quickly and apply it immediately to what you're working on. So get it at arioncodes.com slash design guide. The second tip is that it's really important to have a code review in place so that you can avoid in particular things like bit rot. Also define explicitly somewhere a set of standards and practices that you as a team adhere to. And this is also very important. You have to make the team as a whole responsible for the quality of the code, not just the person who wrote that method that was badly written, but it's the responsibility of the entire team to make sure that the code is of good quality. And that ensures that everybody in your team takes these code reviews seriously. The third tip is also really important, and that is to make your technical debt explicit. Don't just think, oh yeah, we're gonna fix that at some point. Instead, write it down as an actual task as a part of your sprint planning. So for example, you could add technical debt to your backlog as items so that you always know what they are and that you're aware that these need to be done at some point in the future. For example, if you're using something like Trello to manage your backlog, add technical debt items there as well, among the other regular things that you put in there. Doing this explicitly is a good thing because then every time you plan your sprint, then you also see your technical debt items and you can decide to plan them in if there is some room. And that's the fourth tip is that you should always leave some room in your sprint for dealing with technical debt. That way you're spreading the work instead of that you have to suddenly spend an extraordinary amount of time solving technical debt. And this often occurs at one of the most inconvenient moments because th that's always how it goes. So you can plan these technical debt items explicitly, but you can also ask your developers if they see small things that are quick refactors to just do them. And it's also close to what Robert Martin, Uncle Bob calls the Boy Scout rule, which is that you should leave code in a better state than that you found it. So I have one more tip for you and then I have a little bonus. So the fifth tip is to make sure that you prioritize and order technical debt items and also note any dependencies between them. For example, suppose you have a technical debt item that requires you to replace the database access layer. But by doing that, it also means you have to update the database itself. And that might be a lot of work. So it's good to be aware of that before you start working on technical debt items. So a bonus tip to avoid technical debt is to introduce metrics into your system of managing them. There's of course basic things like code coverage when you're writing unit tests. So you know if you have a very low code coverage percentage that you probably need to add more tests to your system to make it more robust. But you can also do other things like count the number of technical debt cards and 
track their progress. And if the number of technical debt items is way higher than the number of regular items, perhaps you should spend some time on solving some of that technical debt. You could even set some kind of alert that if you reach a certain percentage of technical debt items in your backlog, that it automatically sends an alert that you should start taking care of this. But also you can count the number of bugs or issues and make sure that this number never reaches a certain threshold to keep things manageable. And then if you solve a bug, also add a test to make sure that you're testing, that the bug is actually solved, and that if the bug ever reoccurs in the future, then your test is going to point it out. If you have any specific suggestions for dealing with technical debt, please let me know in the comments below. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Now, I'm gonna have to eat all this food that I just bought, so wish me luck. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you next time.